Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very senior professional from the world of banking from New York, USA, Mr. Willem Hendrik Bauter. Willem, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, William is the is an independent economic advisor. He's a speaker. He's a commentator and an expert witness. He is the former global chief economist at the City at City Group. He was a, he has been appointed as the commander of the British Empire CBE in two thousand, and he's an author of seven books. So, William, uh, what an amazing what? journey you've had! Let me start by asking you to tell us about your journey. And what took you to the top as an economist? I started off um, as an academic economist. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I spent um, the largest chunk of my life mm -hmm. uh, teaching at universities, uh, following my PhD uh, at Yale University, mm -hmm. teaching at Princeton University, the LSE, University of Bristol, mm -hmm. Yale University, the LSE again, and then Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. And then in um, 1997, I was uh, called upon unexpectedly, because I wasn't a British citizen at mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. um, to serve on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Wow. The first um, committee, uh, policymaking committee, after the bank was given mm -hmm. its independence in 97. Mm -hmm. Right. I did that for three years, and um, since then, my interest in uh, applying my academic economics mm -hmm. um, in areas outside of academia um, has been uh, has been permanent. Mm -hmm. I um, worked for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for five years. Yeah, that's the bank that looks after the emerging markets and developing countries that result from the breakup of the yeah. Soviet Empire. Mm -hmm. me. And um, I then went back to academia for, um, what was it, uh, five years, five, six years. And then City, uh, somewhat unexpectedly, mm -hmm. called on me mm -hmm. to be the global chief economist. I did that mm -hmm. uh, for eight years, plus a couple of years as a, a special economic advisor. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've been... Uh, Engage as an independent economic expert. Amazing, amazing. What an amazing journey. And one more question, you know, since you were uh, in academia for such a long time and then you started mm -hmm. practicing a lot of the, uh, the, the principles and theories of economy, uh, economics, was there really any difference in what you were teaching and what you were actually practicing? Well, you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, when you actually deal with real-world economic data on a daily basis. Okay. Right? So um, a lot of um, uh, strongly held views about the you know, economic relationship, discourse, business, and that, mm -hmm. that's qualified. Mm -hmm. You become, I think, much less um, certain mm -hmm. about uh, causal connections in economics. Uh, uh, yes, so my main... Um, lesson from praxis is we know a lot less mm. uh, than we thought we did. Mm. Mm. And if, if you know, if you were to look at uh, your crystal ball today and look at the world economy without talking politics, what are some of the key thoughts you have about world economy um, that? our viewers and listeners could learn from? Well, first, let's do the cyclical mm -hmm. uh, picture. Mm -hmm. uh, the global economy is uh, most likely set for a recession. Okay. Right? A, a, a material, non-trivial economic slowdown mm -hmm. that could last uh, up to two years. Okay. And this is a result um, uh, mostly of the uh, monetary tightening mm -hmm. uh, in all the advanced economies, mm -hmm. followed somewhat reluctantly by um, 
the central banks in emerging markets, including uh, India, yep. um, where we're likely to see another rate hike mm. um, by probably 50 basis points mm. uh, at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, and um, um, so we got to get the inflation out of the system. Mm. We cannot live with 7 or 8% inflation mm. uh, politically and as think also from the point of view of economic efficiency. Mm. So the only way uh, to eliminate inflation in a lasting, enduring way mm. is to slow down economic activity for a while. Mm. There is no practical way of achieving painless disinflation. Mm. Then um, um, a more important longer term mm -hmm. um, uh, development mm -hmm. is the consequence of the geopolitical rivalry between uh, the US and China yep. and the bifurcation of the global economy mm -hmm. into a block focused on the US, yeah. the sort of Europe and Japan, uh, Australia and New Zealand, and a block focus on uh, on China, of mm. which, of course, Russia and um, uh, uh, some other countries in Southeast Asia will be part. Mm. Um, India, with uh, much of um, Latin America and mm. Africa, will deal with both blocks. Mm. But the fact that these blocks will be very imperfectly communicating with each other financially and in terms of trade uh, means that there will be a cost Correct. in terms of potential output growth. Right. So I see a slowdown of potential output growth due to this global geopolitical mm. um, uh, uh, tension. I mm. wouldn't call it conflict yet, yeah. fortunately, mm. Mm. Uh, between the US and China. Mm. And then finally, um, I would say the economic consequences of climate change mm -hmm. And the um, private and public sector response uh, to it yeah. is likely to impose another um, non-trivial burden mm. on uh, corporations and indeed households mm. as we start paying more mm. for our greener energy mm. in the years to come. Mm. And uh, what, in your opinion, should political leaders be doing to counter some of the things, of the three things you spoke about, which is, you know, we're set for a recession, which could last up to two years, the geopolitical rivalry and climate change. I think these are all three realities that we are not going to get away from. Absolutely. So um, one thing politicians uh, could do uh, for a change mm. is be honest uh, with their constituents mm. uh, mm. and um, recognize mm. that there will be an economic cost yeah. to regaining control of inflation, yeah. that um, there will be economic costs associated mm. with the reshoring mm. uh, and uh, diversification mm. of uh, supply lines, mm. um, and um, that there are inevitably going to be uh, real costs mm -hmm. in terms of you know, people's pockets mm -hmm. associated with uh, getting hold of, of climate change mm -hmm. and making the world safe for our children. There are going, there's going to be real pain. Mm -hmm. It is inevitable. And um, what is very important is, of course, that it is fairly and, where possible, efficiently distributed. Mm -hmm. So fiscal mechanisms for protecting and compensating people at the lower end of the income scale uh, for the consequences of both um, the fight against inflation, of deglobalization, and of the fight against climate change. Mm. Um, um, you know, th th this will have to be worked out um, through imaginative, brave, mm. and um, costly uh, uh, political economic, economic measures. Very interesting. And yet, I wanted to ask you, you know, when I was growing up or as, till as late as maybe five or seven years ago, the mm -hmm. growing global population was always a concern. 
I find the 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 conversation on population seems to have disappeared from the narrative. Why has this happened? Um, well, the proximate reason is, of course, that um, global population growth is um, much less of an issue mm. because in many parts of the world, not yet in India, mm. um, you know, population growth has leveled off mm -hmm. or is indeed, as may be the case in China this year, mm. uh, become negative. Mm. Right? So uh, a number of countries, uh, Japan included, mm. are already in the aging process mm. uh, um, to the extent that um, the incoming generations no longer make up mm -hmm. for the exiting mm -hmm. uh, generations, this will become much more common. So I think um, uh, we are going to see um, serious demographic uh, tension still mm -hmm. in uh, in Africa, mm -hmm. um, uh, both um, uh, North Africa and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. and in parts of uh, Southeast Asia, mm. uh, including uh, India, where yeah. well, the birth rate is uh, declining, mm. it is still in excess of the mortality rate. So um, uh, we are going to have to come to grips with the fact um, that um, once the transition um, to a stagnant mm. or declining population has been achieved, mm. we're going to face quite different challenges Absolutely. from the ones that they're facing uh, at the moment in countries like India. All right. Well said. Well said, sir. So my next question to you, and let's move on into what is happening with the digital revolution. We are beginning to see that digit digitization is empowering the poorest of the poor. Yes. I'd love to get your perspective on what is going to happen through this digital revolution because forever the poor have been promised houses, clothes and food and they still keep getting the same promises. Well, I don't think that digitization is going to make a significant difference okay. to the accessibility mm. to housing, cloth and food mm. uh, for uh, the poorest segment of the population. Mm. It will make for greater financial inclusion. Okay. I think um, both um, what I would call conventional or centralized digitization mm -hmm. um, of the kind that we've been seeing for decades now mm -hmm. and the more recent uh, distributed ledger-based mm -hmm. um, digitization, the blockchain-based um, crypto digitization mm -hmm. can uh, potentially um, reach parts of the population, bring them into the formal mm -hmm. economic system, allow them to borrow um, from um, counterparties, a wider range of counterparties in the economy, mm -hmm. allowing them to invest their meager resources mm -hmm. at um, more profitable rates than what is currently available. Mm -hmm. So all that is, is positive, okay. but it won't be enough to, <laughs> to end poverty. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a um, significant secular uh, transformation, mm -hmm. uh, and um, DeFi may well be an exciting mm -hmm. new uh, part of that, decentralized finance, that is, the blockchain-based uh, uh, crypto assets, uh, technologies are emerging. But um, don't expect that um, you know, the world is going to be smiling <laughs> at all, all, yes. all, all the poor and deprived mm. uh, as a result of it. Well said, so well said. And, you know, when we talk about the digital economy, we also talk of a lot of data. And the world is now saying data is the new oil. I'd love to get your perspective on what are some of the trends you are seeing in the digital economy and the consumption of data. Is it and as is it something like when I was growing up and the first set of those big IBM computers had come, the term used to be garbage in and garbage out. Um, well, there will always be uh, that problem, right? Um, when you can process enormous amounts of data 
it's also possible to generate enormous amounts of data, um, um, much of which may well uh, be garbage. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and um, what we need, of course, is a sort of information substructure um, that allows us to weed out the lies from the truth mm -hmm. and the nonsense from the facts. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that won't be easy. I think we are going to need you know, uh, people like you um, to um, point people mm. to places where they can you know, separate facts from fancy right. and truth from lies. It is going to be a huge problem. I mean, the web right, yep. is yep. drowning mm. in nonsense and lies. Mm. Um, I scout through it every day mm. uh, trying to put together bits of information that mm. are likely to be true right and you know you have the sources that you like uh, attribute greater credence to than to others mm. but uh, no source mm. can be trusted unconditionally mm. because even if they're honest they can get it wrong mm. given the speed with which facts and series mm. are being delivered mm. uh, at any moment. There's very little time uh, to reflect, to check, mm. to double check. Mm. So yes, there is massive additional information available, which is a huge positive. Mm. Yes, there's also massive additional lies and um, and, and, and nonsense. Being posted, mm. you know, on our doorsteps, on the web, mm. every day, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. which also divide mm. uh, societies mm. into constituencies that almost no longer communicate with each other, which is a real danger. Absolutely, well said, sir. Well said, sir. So I've got, I'm going to move uh, to another type of questions, and this is from the perspective of the startup world, the hundreds of you know unicorns that are being created my first question to you is who knows how to price a business better private equity or stock markets it's a question um i would say that new businesses mm -hmm. are probably priced better by uh by, by private equity mm -hmm. a business that make the transition mm -hmm. from uh you no know, mom and pop uh level efforts mm -hmm. uh to um uh to listed entities mm -hmm. for businesses that are established mm -hmm. uh, have a track record mm -hmm. i think uh the stock market uh, may well be uh, the right way, mm. the best way is no right way. Absolutely. The, be the, the least bad way mm -hmm. of getting approximation mm. to a valuation of the value of its future cash flows. Mm. So I would say, yeah, for the new stuff, private equity, mm. for the established stuff, the markets, Fantastic. stock markets. Thank you. Great response. And a follow-up question to you is that there are old traditional businesses sitting with billions of dollars worth of assets making money, but their value is a small percentage of a tech startup which has no assets, potential of future earning, and worth maybe three, you know, 10 or 12 times the value. How does mm -hmm. the, the economic world uh, give space to both these kind of organizations? Well, it's especially difficult mm -hmm. for the tech startup, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. The established company mm -hmm. uh, that, wow, still generating uh, turnover revenues and profits yes um has seen um you know 
uh, possibly better days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's un is unlikely to open up mm. a whole new vista mm. of uh, new activities mm. and to profit opportunities. Um, that's, I think, served well mm. by the existing arrangements. The, um, uh, yeah, the, the tech startup, mm -hmm. um, uh, where it's all, maybe, mm. where it's all potential, mm. and it's all future, mm. considering, in, including um, possibly uh, many years into mm -hmm. the future, mm. they are served less well by existing arrangements. Mm. Right? For them to get money, right, um, that uh, is, is a real problem, which is why we see uh, all these new ways mm. of um, of, of, of trying to raise money um, you know, through uh, direct um, you know, computer-based mm -hmm. contacts uh, between uh, the borrowing and uh, entity and the investing public. Well said. Uh, we see ICOs and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think we're going to have to see more mm -hmm. um mechanisms for getting money to high potential, high risk, mm -hmm. but high potential um, high-tech enterprises. Mm. Amazing. And Willem, my last question for you, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to your amazing points in, in this conversation. Based on your incredible journey, across uh, academia and in the, the government and banking and the corporate sector, what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away from your journey and our conversation? Well, uh, the first is mm -hmm. uh, in academia, mm -hmm. um, make sure that all questions can be asked. Okay. Right? That there is no research line. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, that um, is considered uh, politically unacceptable Correct. or um, infeasible. Mm. Um, uh, second, um, uh, Work where your passion is. Mm -hmm. If you can be so lucky, it is good. Yeah. But that yeah. that has been uh, the the story of my mm. uh, professional life. Correct. I always, right, um, in fifty years, almost as an economist, mm. have loved whatever I was doing. Mm. Always felt passionate about it. Oh, wow. and, um, the the intrinsic reward mm. to work. Um, it cannot be overestimated. Yes, work is instrumental as well. It puts bread on the table mm. and feeds uh, the family. But the intrinsic joy of um, uh, of of being able to use mm. your brain <laughs> uh, and as well as at times your hand mm. is is not to be underestimated. Mm. And the third warning is to take the long view. Mm. Um, you know, um, uh, politicians yeah. uh, should be doing that, mm -hmm. right? It should they should uh, accept the short run pain mm. of fighting inflation for the long run benefit of living with a, a stable uh, price level. Mm -hmm. um, um, climate change. Biodiversity, mm. um, you know, and then also, um, I would say, uh, for our politicians, and mm. um, try to do something about the global bifurcation. Mm. I do think that um, creating an integrated global economy, mm -hmm. provided there is sufficient uh, domestic fiscal backup mm -hmm. to protect the weak and compensate the losers, mm. but. An integrated global economy is a good thing. Uh, and um, 
um, we should strive not to lose too much of it mm -hmm. to uh, another unfortunate extended geopolitical conflict of the kind that we're likely to see in practice. Wow, well said, sir. Well, on that note, uh, and your amazing three lessons, um, in academia, make sure all questions can be asked, uh, work where your passion is, and take the long view. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about your amazing journey, about how the world is going through so many different changes. Thank you for sharing with me your deep thoughts on uh, startups, valuation. Thank you also for speaking to me about so many different things that you have done. Good luck to you and thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.